Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Edible Education. Thanks for your patience tonight. I thought I'd start with a view of a different, let's see. Pooja, this is not working now. I'm gonna need manual slide advancement. I thought I'd start with a picture of a different idea garden today. There we go. We'll try that. Have you been to the Moffitt undergrad library? Anybody? And next to the free speech cafe, who's been there? So it's interesting because every day, the, um, or a couple times a week, they, the library puts up the front pages of the world's newspapers. Have you seen that? It's pretty striking today. Um, to see that particularly and it it's um, some very this is flashing on and off this monitor is this one staying on yeah. okay yeah. it's a pretty pretty um, sobering headlines as you can imagine today and it struck me that the world has changed dramatically since we got together in class last week and um, visiting the the front pages there in this garden just reminded me how important context is to our understanding. The majority of the front pages were all about the war in Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine. And there were actually a couple of na uh, international newspapers, one I noticed from South Africa, that had no mention of the invasion of Ukraine. So it was really interesting to see how different countries were sharing or interpreting the news. Um, you know, for me, these kinds of events, and this, this event is unprecedented in, in mine and probably your lifetimes too, it um, makes me feel all stirred up like that ball. Um, and I was thinking about, well, what does one do when one feels all stirred up? You know, I personally, I feel like I have a little bit of um, epigenetic trauma related to Ukraine because I have two sets of grandparents who were born in what is now Ukraine. So I just, I feel a deep uh, empathy and compassion for all the people's lives who have been uprooted. And um, I just wanted to take one moment of silence really in, in support and compassion for the people who are in harm's way. So what do you do when you're all stirred up? Um, what I've done is think about core values. And we did a, we had an exercise, a homework assignment a couple of weeks ago where you were given a big sheet of different ideas of values and asked to identify them. And I was thinking about my own core values. I was thinking about the core values of democracy. Um, when I went to research the core values of democracy, I, I saw that they were um, pretty diverse in terms of uh, how they were interpreted from the Constitution, and it made, gave me a better appreciation of how um, important the Supreme Court is in terms of interpreting the core values of the country. They're not really super well um, laid out. Many of them are, but they're all open for interpretation. Um, I also started thinking about Raj Patel's core values. He didn't express them or articulate them exactly as core values, but they came through in his talk. And he was so potent and powerful, I thought it would make sense to just share with you what I heard and saw. The first of his core values was solidarity. He was certainly in solidarity with underrepresented people and people who had been excluded from our traditional systems. He was very sensitive about um, 
the West sort of natural tendency toward appropriation, and he warned us about that. He also talked about accountability. He loved being accountable, held accountable by these groups with whom he was studying or researching or making films about. He also described you know, his life, he said, I'm always hustling. And um, I interpret that as kind of creative tenacity. He wasn't confined to a specific job or role. You know, he told us about his appointment at University of Texas, but that it wasn't full time and he was sort of part in and part out and it gave him this creative freedom to pursue this uh, personal agenda of personal expression. He also expressed as a core value collaboration. You know, he ta talked about his book, Inflame, that he co-created with his co-author, the, the doctor from UCSF. And he also expressed the value of collectivism. Remember, I asked him, what is your advice for everyone here in the auditorium? And he basically said, don't go it alone, find the others. And so I thought that was very um, useful in this moment of turmoil and um, discombobulation. I also just wanted to show, share briefly with you that core values can often be used to organize a group of people around a common mission. And a couple of years ago, the dean at the School of Business here, Rich Lyons, undertook a collective process of trying to articulate what the values or the defining principles were that brought Haas together as a community and also defined Haas perhaps distinctly from other business schools. And so these four defining values about um, questioning the status quo, being students always, um, I've got to look up here again, I'm sorry, being beyond yourself and having confidence without attitude are the key defining principles of the Haas School. Um, I was thinking about, <laughs> I'm having some problems with this. I was thinking about, so, so you have your values and, and then what do you do? How do you take action in moments like this, in moments of crisis? And I was lucky enough to come across this news clip that shows Jose Andreas, who many of you know from World Central Kitchen. He was one of our guests two semesters ago. He spent the whole evening with us. Um, he's a remarkable person and um, a real fearless leader. And he, uh, I'll send you the link to this clip tomorrow. I don't have time to show it to you tonight, but um, he's in Poland uh, serving food to the refugees who are streaming across the border. And so as a food systems change maker, his, his calling is to go where he's needed. And he knows that people who are in strife need to eat and he's mobilized a lot of resources around the world on the ground and elsewhere to, to join in that. And I just found that really inspiring and it was um, amazing to really see someone you know, close to our class and close to our world seeing how do you show up in any situation with your own gifts and talents? How do you apply what you know how to do in the most, call it, high leverage way possible. And I think there's just a really great lesson in that for all of us. I was also thinking about, though well, maybe this is an opportunity to think about food systems intelligence. I mean, this is one of the learning objectives of the class is that you would develop a sense of food systems intelligence. So how does the invasion of Ukraine affect the food system? How might it affect the food system? Any, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, just yell it out so I can hear you and I'll repeat it. Right, Ukraine is a great source of grain for a lot of Europe. So the trade of that commodity will be interrupted for sure. Yes, Sydney.
Excellent. So the, um, because Russia is a great uh, gigantic supplier of, of gas and the world, um, petroleum markets are now in disarray. The cost of fuel is going up. That's going to affect the supply chains that have already been disrupted during pan the pandemic. Let me show you this picture. What do you think this, what do you think this says about the food system? This looks like a pastoral little farm, doesn't it? Any, this is a fertilizer plant and fertilizer is made from natural gas and natural gas is one of the greatest exports of Russia. So um, now that the world community is cutting off trade and interaction with Russia, the supply of natural gas is gonna be interrupted. Germany announced today that they are going to accelerate their climate change goals up to 2030. So this is causing nations that have been dependent on these resources to really change their global energy strategies. But um, a lot of Southeast Asia and other parts of the world are highly dependent on the fertilizers that come from the natural gas that come from Russia. So the impacts on growing uh, food could be um, dramatically impacted. So it's just, a, you know, again, a way of exercising our, our systems thinking to better understand the, the geopolitical ramifications. Um, you all did fantastic on this last assignment, which was to try to assess the carbon impact of your favorite meal. And we just wanted to do a quick shout out to um, Derek, Roy, Sydney, Ricaco, and Hanna for doing really outstanding work. I want to thank you for that. Um, tonight, we're also going to take the last 10, 15 minutes of class to do the midterm evaluation, which our um, student uh, liaisons will facilitate. But you're in for a real treat tonight because um, our special guest speaker tonight is, um, I think, one of the most inspiring change makers I've ever met. She happens to have a, a uh, a route right here on campus. So she has influence at the education and student level, but probably more um, notably, she is a national figure in organizing for the equity and um, rightful livelihoods of those people in the food system who are so poorly paid. I think Raj told us last night that seven of the 10 lowest paying jobs in the United States are associated with the food and agricultural sector. So it's um, a great honor and pleasure to welcome back to Edible Education, Saru Jairaman. Thank you. Okay. And how long would you like me to? We should finish everything by a quarter of So if this pocket bombs, you want to handle Okay. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Um, I would love, since I'm far away from you, to take off my mask. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm more than six feet away from everybody in the room. Is that all right? <laughs> I'm sorry. I have a headache today, and so... Um, Everything's a little bit harder, so that's why if it's helpful to me, thank you to take off my mask. But I'm really happy to be here, and thank you for having me again at Edible Education. Um, for those of you that don't know who I am, I uh, have a couple of different roles in life besides being a mom. <laughs> I uh, lead a center here at UC Berkeley called the Food Labor Research Center, and I teach a class called Social Movements and Organizing and Public Policy. But my role in life that I'm best known for is that I've been leading and organizing various organizations across the country to fight to raise wages and working conditions for restaurant workers and other food workers over the last 20 years. And a lot of my work started on 9-11 when I don't know how old <laughs> many of you were, but I was... Uh, a recent graduate of law school at the time when 9-11 happened, had recently graduated from law school and graduate school. And I was in New York City 
and 9-11 happened, and there was a restaurant at the top of the World Trade Center, Tower One, called Windows on the World. It was on the 107th and 108th floor of Tower One of the World Trade Center. And on that morning, 73 workers died in the restaurant. They either jumped to their deaths from the 107th, 108th floor, or they were evaporated inside the restaurant because the plane actually hit below them and the heat rose so quickly that they were basically incinerated pretty quickly. Uh, most of the workers, you know, which is very um, uh, common for the restaurant industry in New York and LA and the Bay Area, most of the workers that were there were immigrants from all over the world preparing for the day's meals in the restaurant. Many of them were undocumented. And uh, a lot of them had families that had no way to even know that they had passed, no way to reconnect with the bodies if there was a body of their loved ones. And so there was a disaster at the time, and it was an eerily similar to what we've been experiencing during the pandemic. People had died, people were afraid to eat out, um, so restaurants were closing or had cl or closed, uh, people lost their jobs. And so in the aftermath of the tragedy, I was asked as a young woman, young attorney, to start a relief center for restaurant workers who had lost their jobs and the families of the victims. And so we started the Relief Center. I was always an academic while being an organizer, so I, I was teaching at the time at NYU and Brooklyn College. And so I, I always had this curiosity as we started the center and started hearing from workers, first in New York and then all over the country, about their needs and conditions. We would do surveys. We would have, we do what's called participatory research. If you don't know what that is, look it up. It's basically where you engage people that are supposed to be your subjects in actually being researchers of their peers. So we trained restaurant workers to conduct surveys of their fellow workers, first in New York and then as we grew all over the country. And everywhere we went, in every city we went to, workers would always name as their top issue, their top priority, their top concern, wages, 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 wages. So my wages, dummy, it's my wages. And as an academic, and as somebody who cares about what's going on with workers, I, we said, why? Why is this the case that everywhere we go, restaurant workers are talking about their wages? Well, when we looked at the government data, it made sense. Because prior to the pandemic, the restaurant industry reached 14 million workers. It's actually the second largest private sector employer in the United States, and the number one fastest growing private sector employer in the United States. Um, 14 million workers reached, 14 million workers means right before the pandemic we reached almost one in 10 American workers working in restaurants. And one in two Americans that have worked in the industry at some point in their lifetime, half of America has worked in a restaurant at some point in their life. How many people here have worked or work in a restaurant? That's about half the room. And that's true everywhere I go, everywhere I speak. About half of America has worked in restaurants at some point during their lifetime, yet despite the industry's size and its growth, it has always been the absolute lowest paying employer. And that's that data point that Raj, I guess, shared with you, that every year we look at the US Department of Labor's 10 lowest paying jobs. Every year, seven of the 10 are in the restaurant industry. And zooming out for one second, because I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about restaurants, but zooming out for one system second to the food system, because I know that's what you talk about in this class, there are 20 million workers in the entire food system, almost 14 million of which are in the restaurant industry. Uh, and so the restaurant industry is the biggest chunk of the food system. It's the biggest, it's the second biggest rest industry overall in the whole economy. But if you look at the full US uh, food system, 20 million workers, that's about one in five private sector workers in the United States. If you look at the top 10 lowest paying jobs in America, the seven lowest paying jobs are all in the restaurant industry. The eighth lowest paying job, higher than most restaurant jobs, is farm workers. So eight of the 10 lowest paying jobs in America are in the food system. And <laughs> that should say something to you about how dysfunctional our food system is in the United States because so much of those 20 million workers, so many of those 20 million workers can't actually afford to put food on their own family's tables, can't afford to eat out in restaurants, can't afford to buy food for their families, 
all of which got so much worse during the pandemic. And it's, it's a completely dysfunctional system that hurts all of us, the food system, the economy, and certainly those workers. So um, coming back to restaurants, when we understood that this is the nation's largest and fastest growing industry and yet the lowest paying, then of course it made sense that everywhere we went, workers would say, my wages, my wages, my wages. That's my top concern. But when we tried to understand why, how, it is, how is it that you've got such a huge and fast growing industry with the lowest paying jobs? Because if you take a step and think about that, shouldn't it be the case that if an industry is growing really fast, it's doing well. There's clearly money. An industry doesn't grow unless there's money coming into it. An industry doesn't grow unless there's profits to be had. Uh, and so how is it, why is it that you've got such a huge and fast growing industry with consistently the lowest paying jobs? And so when we did the research, many years of research, over and over and over again, the research points to the money, power, and influence of a trade lobby called the National Restaurant Association, or the other NRA. It's driven by the chains. It was founded in 1911. It was founded actually with the express purpose of suppressing wages for food workers in the United States. And it was founded about 50 years after emancipation when really it began, even before it was called the NRA, it began fighting to, to basically keep wages in this country as low as, I would say, inhumanely possible. Because at emancipation, something happened in the United States of America. At emancipation, the restaurant industry mutated this new idea that had just come from Europe at the time called tipping. They mutated it from being an extra or bonus on top of a wage to becoming the wage itself in order to be able to hire black people for free. So let's go back to feudal Europe for a second. In feudal Europe, you had aristocrats and nobles. If you ever watch Downton Abbey or you read old English literature, you'll see references to tipping. I, I happen to read sometimes old English literature in my spare time, just <laughs> sometimes it's fun. If you have any of you have ever read um, Jeeves and Wooster, it's like these old English comedies about a, man, a rich man and his butler. And you'll see these references where but, uh, Wooster, this, arist this aristocrat, gives Jeeves, here's an extra 20 quid, old man, for a job well done. That is where tipping comes from. It comes from servants in feudal Europe who got a wage, got a salary from their boss but they would get an extra or a bonus on top of the wage from time to time as noblesse oblige, a noble or an aristocrat giving a lesser, an inferior person, an extra or bonus. Well, that idea came to the States in the 1850s and 1860s when rich Americans traveled to Europe, tried to come back, tried to show off that they knew the rules of Europe, and tried to start tipping. And Americans initially resoundingly rejected tipping. There was a huge populist anti-tipping movement. Six states banned tipping in the United States. They said, we are a democracy. We're not feudalism. Um, Americans should get good service regardless of how much we can afford to tip. And we believe employers should pay workers, not customers. And that anti-tipping movement spread to Europe. The labor movement picked it up in Europe and actually said, we are professionals. We don't need your largesse. We, we, need, we demand to be paid as the professionals that we are. And got rid of tipping in much of Europe, So, which is why when you go to Europe now, often people will feel insulted if you try to tip because they say, I'm a professional. I don't, I don't need your tip. But in the United States, we went in the exact opposite direction for, because two things happened. First, in 1850, Waiters across the East Coast of the United States, from Chicago East, in Chicago, in Boston, in New York, they went on strike. At that time in 1850, waiters were mostly men, and they got a wage from their boss. There was no tipping at the time. They got a wage from their boss, and they went on strike in multiple cities in 1850, demanding higher wages. And the restaurant industry, in response, replaced them all with women. So they said, fine, I, we don't want to pay you more. They replaced them with women. So women entered the industry in 1850 so that these restaurants could pay them a lesser wage. 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. At that time, the restaurant industry saw another opportunity. They said, oh, newly freed black people, we, they've never been paid, after all, for generations in the United States. We can continue to not pay them by letting them live exclusively on tips. 
And so they created a system in which they didn't pay the workers anything at all, and they had them live on this new thing that had just come from Europe called tipping. And in many instances, they even they charged black people for the privilege of having a position in which they'd get white people's tips. Shoe shiners were charged for the privilege of having a shoe shine station. Servers and bartenders were charged for the privilege of being able to obtain white people's tips in a restaurant. The idea of tipping at that time in the United States alone, because no other country does this, no other country has this sordid history, the idea of tipping in the US thus changed from becoming an extra or bonus that has it always had been to becoming the wage itself. And in 1938, as part of the New Deal, when everybody else got the right to the federal minimum wage for the first time, millions of black workers were excluded. Farm workers were excluded because they were mostly black. Domestic workers were excluded, they were mostly black. And tipped restaurant workers, who were mostly black women at the time, were excluded and told you get a zero dollar wage as long as tips bring you to the full minimum wage. And we went from zero in 1938 to the current extraordinary federal minimum wage for tipped workers of $2 and 13 cents an hour. And in 43 states to this day, not in California, but in 43 states in the United States of America, we still have this sub-minimum wage, a legacy of slavery. In about 20 states, including New Mexico, just two states over, the wage is literally two bucks an hour, $2.13. New Mexico, Texas, most of the South, it's $2.13. In, in 40 state, 43 states in total, it is a sub-minimum wage, and in four out of five states, it's $5 or less. So our nation's capital of Washington, D.C., $5.05. Maryland, Virginia, $3.63. Pennsylvania, $2.83. Michigan, $3.67. Been doing this for so long, I've memorized all the wages for all the workers, but it's insane. Whatever it is, it's incredible. It's outrageous. In 2022, to have most states, and four out of five states, pay the nation's largest workforce. This is not some tiny sliver of the population I'm talking about. I told you one in 10 American workers currently works in the industry. One in two Americans has worked in the industry at some point in their lifetime. This is the nation's fastest growing industry gets to pay $5 or less in four out of five states in the United States of America in 2022. And you know, I think it's important to just take a moment to understand, if you go back to that history of 1863, until that moment, waiters were white, they were men, and they got a wage. Basically, the wage went down to zero as women and black people entered the, the industry. It went down to zero, to nothing, as women and black people entered the industry. So why do we have a wage today of $2? One answer is the extraordinary over-influence of a trade lobby called the National Restaurant Association. The other answer is, in America, we devalue women, and we especially devalue women of color. We devalue them actually at a rate of $2.13 an hour. Two-thirds of tipped workers today are women. They are mostly women working in very casual restaurants, IHOPs, Denny's, Applebee's. They struggle with three times the poverty rate of other workers and the absolute highest rates of sexual harassment of any industry in the United States of America. That is now irrefutable because they have to tolerate inappropriate customer behavior to get those tips. Our research shows managers tell Young women, older women in restaurants, dress more sexy, show more cleavage, wear tighter clothing so that you can make more money in tips, which means women in restaurants are not told just to tolerate harassment. Oh, no, they're told to actually go out and encourage it. And the more you can encourage it, the better you do. That's how you make more money in tips. And we know that this is, can be directly correlated back to this sub-minimum wage because there are seven states that have never done this, California, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Minnesota, Montana, and Alaska. These are not all blue states. They range from blue to purple to red. And they've all required a full minimum wage with tips on top since their inception. And if you listen to the National Restaurant Association, you would think these seven states have no restaurants. Because when I travel and I speak in Congress or I go speak in state legislatures and I say we should pay everybody a full wage, the response in the Restaurant Association is, oh no, that would kill the industry, all jobs would be lost, you know, everything would go to hell in a handbasket 
if we had to pay people a wage. When in fact, in the seven states, including the state you live in and you eat out in, called California, the restaurant industry is growing faster than the 43 states with a sum minimum wage for tipped worker. Job growth is higher. Small business restaurant growth rates are higher. Tipping averages are higher. San Francisco has the highest tipping average of any city in the US. Alaska has the highest tipping average of any state. And we have not only much lower poverty rates, but one half the rate of sexual harassment in the restaurant industry. In the seven states with one fair wage, why is it that we have so much less sexual harassment? Well, it turns out when you pay a woman an actual full wage, she doesn't have to put up with as much from uh, customers. She can count on a wage from her boss. If somebody tries to grab her or say something to her, she can say, buzz off, because she can count on this wage. Whereas in Arizona and New Mexico and Texas, you get two bucks. When you get $2 an hour, that wage goes to taxes. You literally don't get a wage. You live on your tips. And when you live on your tips, you have to put up with whatever the customer does to you, however they touch you or treat you or talk to you, because that is how you feed your children that evening. That is how you pay your bills, your rent, you keep the lights on. And we have a very high percentage of single mothers working in this industry who are feeding children on tips. And so they will do what they have to do to get those tips. Whereas in California, they can count on a wage from their boss. They're not as dependent on the tip. And it's that power dynamic. Fundamentally, you know, sexual harassment comes down to a power dynamic. The power dynamic in this case between a woman server and everybody else in the restaurant, the customer, her coworker, the manager, because she's so reliant on the tips that go up and down. That power dynamic between women and especially customers got so much worse during the pandemic. With the pandemic, six million restaurant workers lost their jobs. And two-thirds of those workers reported that they actually couldn't get unemployment insurance because in most states they were told their wages were too low to qualify for benefits. One example, Sarah May, uh, a woman who reached out to me from a small town in Michigan, a server, a bartender in a dive bar in a small town in Michigan with a child, autistic child. She... Uh, she applied for unemployment insurance. She had worked for years. She said, I religiously report my tips to the IRS, but when I went to go report to get unemployment insurance, the state denied my claim. They said, your wage of $3.67 is too low, and your boss never reported your tips, so it looks like that's all you earned, and therefore you don't qualify. So she was shut out of state unemployment insurance. She went to apply for federal unemployment insurance, and they told her, basically, you're eligible when she tried to access federal unemployment insurance, she was denied because the state of Michigan had already marked her as a denial, so she never got federal unemployment insurance. So she never got anything. And this was true for two-thirds of restaurant workers in the states with a sub-minimum wage. Two-thirds of these workers couldn't access benefits. So I find it hilarious, all this speculation over the last many months. Oh, are these people not coming back because they're sitting at home collecting unemployment insurance? Well, we know that two-thirds of these workers never even got it. They didn't get it. And they were forced to go back to work in the summer of 2020 before they felt safe or ready because they had no choice. They had no benefits. So they went back to work. We surveyed about 10,000 of these workers. They reported that tips were way down. 70% of workers reported tips went way down because sales were down. And they, were, they said that customer hostility and health risks and sexual harassment, which was already highest in our industry of any industry, went way up. With thousands of women reporting, I'm regularly asked, take off your mask so I can see how cute you are before I decide how much to tip you. Take off your mask so I can see the pretty face of my server before I decide how much I want to tip. I had a, we have a member in Washington, D.C., who was on CNN recently, IFOMA, she said she was a bar she's a bartender. She's a bartender in Washington, D.C. during the pandemic. Customers said, take off your mask. I want to see your face before I decide how much to tip. She said, no. He said, well, I guess you're not going to eat tonight. And it's that idea that many customers have that I tip, therefore I own you. Take off your mask. Do as I ask. Put up with me grabbing you or saying something to you. Smile. I need to see you smile. or Otherwise, I'm not going to tip you that much. It's that sense that people have that they own you because they tip you that basically let, re, had so many workers reach their limit. And it was especially the moment summer, fall 2020 
when so many workers were asked to do so much more for so much less, tips were way down, and now they were asked to enforce social distancing, mask rules, and COVID vaccination card rules on the very same customers from whom they had to get tips. And that was their breaking point. You know, 70% of workers said tips went down. 80% of black workers said their tips went down. 60% of workers said, I get tipped less when I try to enforce these rules, therefore I'm not gonna enforce the rules. 73% of black workers said, I get tipped less when I try to enforce these rules. Customers did not wanna hear from a black server or bartender, wear a mask, six, 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 sit six feet apart, or show me your vaccination card. They did not wanna hear that. And so workers left. Workers left, they were done, that was it. You don't pay me enough to put up with what I put up with every day during the pandemic. You don't pay me enough to put up with the kind of hostility, harassment, and frankly, life or death situations that I'm in. And one million workers have left this industry. And of those who remain, 54% say they're leaving, 80% say the only thing that would make them come back is a full livable wage with tips on top. And this most amazing, historic, incredible thing has happened. In response to millions of workers leaving this industry, thousands of restaurants, and we created a database uh, with funding from a foundation. We created a huge database where we've been tracking restaurants all over the country, from Louisiana to Maine to Michigan, now paying 15, 20, 25, 30. We've even seen restaurants in Cape Cod paying 50 bucks an hour plus tips. Many of these are restaurants who said, it can't be done, we'll all go out of business, I can never pay higher than $2, now paying $15, $20, $25 an hour in order to recruit workers to come back to work. And we're hearing from workers all over the country, I finally know my worth. I know I'm worth more than $2. And if the government told me that I earned too little to get unemployment insurance, maybe I earned too little and I should never have accepted this to begin with. And millions of workers are organizing, they are forming unions, they are standing up. I've been organizing restaurant workers for 20 years. Never heard from the Hooters, women at Hooters, anything about their uniforms. Last year, the women at Hooters stood up against their uniforms, rejected the uniforms. Things are changing. Workers are demanding that they be treated with dignity and respect and that they be valued as the professionals that they are. Because if anybody here has ever worked in a restaurant, you probably know it is hard work. And the only reason that it is not considered a profession, as it is in Europe, by the way, you go to school for many years to be a hospitality professional in Europe. The only reason it is not considered a profession here is not that it doesn't take skill or training to be a good restaurant worker. The only reason it's not considered a profession is because of the way these workers are treated and paid. That is the only reason and workers have had it, and they've come to the point where they're saying, I will only stay if I'm treated and paid as the professional that I am, the skilled professional that I am, and lo and behold, employers are finding they must respond. So we're in this incredibly historic moment. I've been telling reporters up and down, this is not a once in a lifetime moment, this is not a once in a generation moment, this is a once in a nation's history moment because it has taken 150 years since emancipation, now almost 160 years next year, and a global pandemic for workers in the millions to say, I refuse, I refuse to live off of this legacy of slavery. I refuse to live off of tips and get paid two bucks an hour. I reject it. Take your job and shove it. It's a historic, historic moment. It's created so much upheaval, and it has changed the pol political landscape as well on this work. Because for the last decade, we have been moving legislation in multiple states and in Congress to raise the overall minimum wage to $15 an hour and end sub-minimum wages for not just tipped workers, workers with disabilities get a sub-minimum wage because of a grotesque, antiquated idea that people with disabilities are less productive than other workers. Incarcerated workers get a sub-minimum wage because of the exception to the 13th Amendment that allows for slavery in the case of incarceration. And here in this state, we should be ashamed of ourselves because a third, a full third of our firefighting workforce are incarcerated people saving our lives for 11 cents an hour. Youth get a sub-minimum wage in many states. Uh, this is my most recent book, One Fair Wage. We document all the different subminimum wages. Two are legacies of slavery, both the incarcerated workers' subminimum wage and the, the subminimum wage for tipped workers. 
And so we've been moving bills and ballot measures for many years in many states. And it's been a very tough fight because we're up against this very formidable enemy in the form of the National Restaurant Association, which has followed me around the country and put my children's up, pictures up on attack websites and put about five or six million dollars into trying to shut us down, scare me, attack me, I've had death threats. It hasn't worked. We've kept fighting, but what they have done successfully until the pandemic was that every time we won this, because I got to tell you, any time we put this on the ballot anywhere in the country, red or blue state, it passes. Americans overwhelmingly agree, whether they are Republican or Democratic voters, oh, Americans overwhelmingly agree that people who work should be paid. People who work should be paid a fair wage, a full wage, and not have to rely on tips. Americans overwhelmingly agree. It is elected officials who live in an echo chamber with the National Restaurant Association who believe somehow it's controversial when the vast majority of Americans agree on this issue. You know, we were in Albany, New York on the day we were protesting for $15 for restaurant workers in Albany, which is the capital of New York State, on the day that the Electoral College of New York was nominating Biden as their nominee to the Electoral College, and there were a bunch of MAGA people, Trump supporters there, actually protesting that the Electoral College should name Trump and not Biden as their nominee. So we were out there, a bunch of mostly women of color from New York City that had come up to Albany demanding a $15 wage, and right next to us were all these folks from outstate New York, MAGA folks, mostly white, you know, screaming lots of strange things. And so we were a little afraid, but they came over to our protest. Uh, they finished their protest before ours. So they came over and asked us, what are you doing here? We said, we're here for $15 for restaurant workers, and would you believe many of them joined our protest? They said, yeah, we agree with that. People should get paid for fair work, for fair pay. So this is overwhelmingly popular among most people in America. And, but yet, elected officials are always behind the curve on this because of their donations, because of who they're listening to, because of what they're hearing. So we have been moving bills and ballot measures in multiple states. We won this on the ballot in Washington, D.C. We won it in Maine. We won it in Michigan. But in every one of those instances, the Restaurant Association bribed elected officials to overturn the will of the people. So we kept winning, and then it kept getting reversed. Finally, in 2019, we won it in the U.S. House of Representatives. It was the first time since emancipation that either House of Congress moved to end the subminimum wage for tipped workers, since emancipation. And then we kept fighting. In 2020, Joe Biden named our campaign, One Fair Wage, as part of his campaign platform and made it one of his signature issues. And in fact, named, talked about it last night as part of the State of the Union and made it one of his first bills that he proposed even before inauguration. He made it part of his COVID relief package. In Ju July of this past year, July 2021, he was at a CNN town hall and a restaurant owner got up and said, I don't have enough workers, what are you gonna do for me? And Joe Biden said, you gotta pay them more. He said, my sister-in-law is a tipped worker in Atlantic City, she makes seven bucks an hour plus tips. She said, he said, nobody wants to work for that anymore. Everybody wants 15 plus tips. So he's been very, very clear on the issue, as has leadership of both houses, but the issue has not moved since last spring because of the National Restaurant Association. And so we kept winning and it kept getting stalled or pushed back until this past fall, when the great resignation, which we're calling a great revolution, reached such a point that so many restaurants are now paying this, including those that fought us before, that everything has changed. And I'll just give Washington, D.C. as an example. In Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, the minimum wage for tipped workers is $5.05 an hour. Everybody else, non-restaurant workers, gets $15 an hour. The only reason tipped workers get $5 is because of the power of the Restaurant Association. So in 2018, we won this on the ballot because we, we win it on, whenever it goes to the ballot, people vote yes. So we won it on the ballot. Restaurant Association in DC got the chair of the city council to overturn the will of the people. Well, we filed it again just a few months ago, fall 2021. The day we filed it, the head of the Restaurant Association in DC calls me. She says, we're not gonna fight you this time around because so many of our people are already paying this. She said, none of us can afford to be publicly fighting it 
when we're desperately looking for staff. So true to their word, we've now collected all the signatures we need to be on the June ballot in 22 in DC. There's been no opposition and the chair of the city council has now announced this will pass and we will not overturn it. And so we are in a moment of historic change. This is moving in states across the country. On Valentine's Day, we got together with Steven Spielberg and a bunch of tech donors and we announced we're committing $25 million to raise the minimum wage and end subminimum wages in 25 states by the United States 250th anniversary, which is 2026. In 2026, we will be celebrating the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. And we want to ask the country, what kind of country do we want to be at our 250th anniversary and in our next 250 years? Do we want to be the kind of country that persists with the legacy of slavery and persists with the wage structure that has not only impoverished people, but is now basically killing the industry? Because I got to tell you, when 54% of workers say they're leaving, you have two choices. Cut the industry in half. Expect half the dining you had pre-pandemic or raise the wage. Those are the only two options at this point. So what kind of country do we want to be? Do we want to be a country where, because of the greed of restaurant corporations like IHOP and Denny's and Applebee's, we allow this legacy of slavery to persist? We don't reopen the economy because we don't want to pay people. We allow a legacy of slavery to persist. We allow harassment of women to persist. We allow all of that to persist. Or do we want to be a country that says once and for all, no, we are a country that listens to people, not to trade lobbyists, not to major corporations. We are a country that wants to get over our original sin, our legacy of slavery. We are a country that wants to move towards actually taking care of our people because as a nation, there are only two options take care of our people or fail as a country. Because if we don't raise wages, there will be no consumption power for the beautiful food system you all are talking about in this class. If we don't raise wages, there will be no consumption power for this economy to recover. There will be no ability for people to engage. The likes of Donald Trump will return. That is what happens when you don't take care of your people. And that is where we are headed unless we change course now. I'll stop there. <laughs> Did I do okay timing? How are you feeling? I'm better, actually. I could tell. Three Advils. <laughs> three, three Advils goes a long way. Yeah. That's great. Thank you, Saru. Is it okay? Do you want me to put it back on? It's okay. It's okay with me. You guys okay? In front? Um, so I want to invite everybody to be in conversation with Saru for the next half hour or so. So if you have a question that you can phrase in a nice, tight, concise way, or do your best, please come to one of the microphones. Um, I have just so enjoyed watching the arc of all of this unfold since we started having you as a guest here, I don't know, five, six years ago. It's quite remarkable. So thank you for underlining the importance of timing. It's, it's really powerful. And this confluence of factors coming together, this could be the great silver lining of transformation that comes from this pandemic, right? And, um, you know, I was thinking, I was working on my taxes over the weekend, and, you know, you have to put your occupation, you have to, like, describe what you are. And I was just sitting there thinking, like, well, how would I describe Saru's <laughs> occupation? How do, you, how do you think of that? You're, you're an academic. I mean, you, you kind of specialize in this rare form of evidence-based activism that informs policy. And, and you you found this concoction or this like recipe for for doing this that's so I mean you're doing this on a national level and you've got people all over the country who are organized with you I mean you you are clearly the you know a, a, an unmatched spokesperson I think you you articulate everything so in such a compelling way but can you talk a little bit about how do you really get organized in this way? How does research turn into 
action and, and organizing and policy. Share a little of the strategy around that. Yeah, so at, at the core of everything that I do, it's funny when you're saying occupation, sometimes I have to just mark other, because it's true, I, 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 I'm an academic, I'm a lawyer, I'm an author, I'm an uh, organizer. I mean, the organizer is, the, is what is closest and dearest and, and the center of my heart. And, uh, and not everybody, I think, unless you've taken my class, knows what I mean by that. Organizing is something very specific. It's an art, it's a profession in this country. You know, you can go to school to be an organizer. Organizing means, in our definition, collective action by the, led by the people most impacted. So in this case, restaurant workers, not me. So collective action led by the people most impacted, engaging in direct action meaning they're confronting directly, confrontationally confronting those in power to change the balance of power, to make demands, to change uh, their conditions, and to change the balance, fundamentally to change the balance of power. And so that we distinguish that form of work from any community service, from advocacy, from activism, because, you know, and I can go through how, why we distinguish it in those ways, but Fundamentally, what's different about organizing is that the protagonist is not me. The protagonist is the people who lead their own struggle. And the, and the solution is not solving a problem. It's actually fundamentally changing systems and structures of power. Who has power and who doesn't have power? What we're doing is building the collective power to actually maintain that power over time. And so the strategy is, is above all that. And the research is a tool to allow that collective to express their needs and conditions. So when we do the research, it's surveys of workers or workers surveying each other or looking at government data of workers' needs and conditions to take what we're hearing from workers, their stories, their needs, their conditions, and showing the aggregate of what they're experiencing and what they're saying, but ultimately allowing them. I said one of our leaders, Ifoma, was on CNN. Maybe there might be a chance for me to show you the quick yeah. clip of her. Um, but Could you help with that? yeah, um, but uh, but uh, but you know that's what I mean. That's mm -hmm. that that it's she's at the forefront. We are organizers, meaning we facilitate their leadership uh, of their own struggle. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can. And you can teach and learn this, just Absolutely. kind of like entrepreneurship. Exactly. You know, they used to say, you can't teach entrepreneurship. It's a God-given gift. But <laughs> yeah. No, it's a skill. It's a profession. It's like you, you in, in my dream world, one day, just like you go to law school or business school, you could go to a school here at Berkeley. I'm trying to build a certificate program here at Berkeley as a start in organizing here, here. so that people could consider it as a, as an or, as a profession or a career. Um, they have it at Harvard, you know, Marshall Gans teaches organizing mm -hmm. and he has a whole program mm -hmm. around it. Hopefully one day here at Berkeley we'll have the same. Well, st students, um, you should ask for it. Yeah, let me see if I can pull it up real quick. Who's got a question? While well, Saru it's sets up this, um, yeah. come on over and just give her a chance to Up like this. Hey, Eric in the control booth or Alan, could you turn this monitor yeah, off? Because it's just flickering. I don't know if you can turn it off, but it's just, fl no, you can't right now. Okay. Have you got it ready no, or uh, no? I'll text okay, let's do a question yeah, here sure. and then we'll come back. So introduce yourself and. Sure. Let so it go. my name's Aditya. I'm a freshman. Uh, here at Berkeley studying molecular and cell biology and business administration. Um, I've always thought of politics rather cynically. I think the only way you can convince a politician is with a checkbook, but <laughs> clearly you've figured out a way to avoid that. Can you talk about like strategies that you use to like convince politicians that aren't with money? Yeah, so I mean, it depends on the elected official, right? Some elected officials can be moved by, you know, data and, uh, <laughs> and by research and by reason. But I got to tell you, that is not how most change happens in this country. I, I think it's a, 
I, I'm going to say it's a real misunderstanding of the elite, especially the left, left elite, that we can change everything through data analysis. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, that's not how politics works in this country. Um, some of it is, is, is ca you can create an emotional you know, change. You can bring workers and employers and have them voice their needs and concerns, and elected officials will change their mind. But ultimately, the best way we know to move elected officials is power. And that means that it takes organizing of workers and employers to sit in on elected officials' offices or corner them on the street or uh, show up at their fundraisers, or um, you know, any number of ways to actually move them right from point A to point B, and it's generally not data. <laughs> there are elected officials who maybe might already be open to the issue, and data helps educate them, and they get it. But if they're stuck in a certain place because they're beholden to the National Restaurant Association, for example, the only thing that's going to move them is to, sh is to actually show that there are consequences for doing that. Sure. Consequences that show up in uh, a, a public you know, humiliation that they don't want, or a public scandal that they don't want, or consequences in the form of getting voted out because nobody likes them, no, nobody believes in them. You know, so those are the kinds of things we feel like we have to do quite often to move people who feel, who are beholden to the Restaurant Association. There are a whole swath, yes, of elected officials who can be educated on the issue, and that's different. But if people are stuck somewhere because of money, which I think is your question, because they're getting donations from the Restaurant Association, the only thing that will move them is organizing, is the power of the people demanding that they be listened to or there will be consequences. Consequences in the form of losing your seat or you know, being, having something come out in the public that you don't want to come out in the public because ultimately it will affect your ability to run again. Sure, that makes sense, thank you. Saru, a few years ago I had some interaction with some members of the National Restaurant Association oh. and I remember when I was looking at the board of directors this, you know, this was sort of informed by my Berkeley perspective here, but I thought to myself, boy, this organization has a DEI problem in the works. <laughs> and this was before DEI was really on the radar yeah. for every organization to be thinking about. Has, has it changed at all in the last few years? I mean, how have they responded in, you know, as, as you look at their... Yeah. I mean, they, they for a while did have a woman, you know, uh, who led the NRA. They've they have a, they've had one or two black CEOs of the different, you know, Darden for a while, which is the nation's largest full service restaurant company, had a black CEO. But, um, that guy who ran for president, right, right, Herman Cain. Herman Cain. Right, exactly. Yeah. But uh, for the most part, they are what we call pale, male, and stale. <laughs> <laughs> they, they have a long way to go on DEI issues. Um, they are uh, they are very stuck in their ways. Even now, I mean, look, there is an extraordinary new movement of amazing restaurant owners that have changed their mind on this issue. Thousands of them. We have an association of 2,000 restaurant owners who actually agree with us. You've had some of them as speakers: Danny Meyer, Tom Colicchio, but also mom and pop restaurants around the country that actually Alice, of course, who believe in livable wages and equity. Uh, during the pandemic, we created a program called High Road Kitchens, where we partnered with governors and mayors, and we actually gave out grants to restaurants that were willing to transition during the pandemic to a full livable wage with tips on top and go through our racial equity program to change their hiring, training, retention practices so that the restaurants could desegregate, because that's another issue we didn't get to talk about, is restaurants are crazy segregated racially uh, and gender-wise. And so, um, we have this amazing new you know, field of restaurant owners, and many of whom have changed their minds. Jose Andres changed his mind on this issue during the pandemic. And yet the Restaurant Association is the dinosaur in the room. They're just, they're stick in the mud. Restra other restaurant owners call them the party of no. You know, they just, even other trade associations look at the Restaurant Association as the dinosaur because they refuse to move. And it is because for so long they have profited since for 150 years off a system in which they literally do not pay their workers. They get away with it saying, you the customer should pay my workers for us. 
And what's so, what's so extraordinary is last April, when this was moving in Congress with a lot of momentum and steam, Newsweek published an expose. Um, David Sirota, some of you may know who David Sirota is. He helped to write the movie Don't Look Up that was on Netflix, and he's an investigative reporter. Um, David Sirota did an expose where the several CEOs and CFOs of different NRA companies were telling Congress in February 2021, there is no way we can afford to pay $15 and one fair wage, a full minimum wage with tips on top. We'll all go out of business. We'll all die. And in that same moment, these CFOs and CEOs were telling shareholders who were starting to get scared because of what these people were saying in the public, they were telling shareholders, don't worry, actually paying 15 in California has caused our companies to grow faster in California than any state in the US because consumer spending is higher when you pay people more. In fact, the, the CFO of Denny's, Robert Versatech, was caught red-handed in the same moment telling Congress 15 will kill us and simultaneously telling shareholders on a shareholder call, paying 15 plus tips has resulted in Denny's growing, his words, outperforming the system compared to all other states because he said consumer spending is higher in California than it is in any other state. So they know it to be true. They just refuse to move because they've got, they, if they can pay people $2, they will. And they terrify small business employers. And I'm sure many of you have heard and maybe believe the idea that raising wages would, is just terrible, would kill business. That is this mantra they've had for so long. And it's just not proven true in any of the states where wages have gone up, including California. So I would imagine it, another leverage point would be eaters, right? And I know uh, One Fair Wage has experimented with tools of how to activate eaters. I'm wondering like, if you're a, a student and you happen to have discretionary resources and you go to another state, you know, say you're gonna go to, you're gonna move to Texas and um, gosh, you just woke up and realized that the person that's serving you might be getting $2 an, an hour. Yeah. W what, do we, what do we do? How do we, do we not go to Texas or? <laughs> no, go to Texas. <laughs> um, so I think first though, it's important to say in a food systems class that I, I feel like for so long in food systems, there's been this idea that all we have to do is shop differently and all problems will be solved. We buy the organic tomato, pat ourselves on the back, and go home. We go to the you know, uh, sustainable restaurant, pat ourselves on the back, and go home. And for those of you that are active in the climate change space, you know that that doesn't solve the problem. And it's true on labor issues, too. Simply choosing the restaurant that's doing the right thing, which is not that many of them, doesn't solve the problem. Why? Because... Uh, yes, con con you know, there can be consumer intervention and activity that does solve the problem, but it will never be enough. We can't shop our way out of structural problems because the structural problems ultimately are political and structural in nature. And so we have to do two things at the same time. We have to know that we are citizens. And I don't use that term in terms of like to distinguish undocumented versus documented. I mean citizen in the true word, uh, the true origin of the word citizens. We are members of a polity. We are all people in a country where there's a political system and each of us has the power to not only be a consumer, but to flex our citizen muscle, as Mary Nessel has said so many times. And so the first thing to do is to communicate when you go to another state uh, you know, that things should change as a consumer. You know, communicate with legislators, communicate with senators, Congress members, state legislators. I am coming to this state, but I'm horrified by the fact that the wage here is $2 an hour, it should change. And then the second thing to do is, yes, look on our app, on our website. We have a website called highroadrestaurants.org where you can see, go to your geography and see restaurants that are doing the right thing and paying livable wages. But don't just go there because I just said, don't just choose the other restaurant. Eat anywhere you're going to eat. At the end of your meal, tell the manager or the owner at the restaurant, not the server, because they have no power and you could actually get them in trouble. Go talk to the manager or owner. Ask to speak to the manager or owner at the end of the meal and say, I came to eat here. I love the food. I love the service. 
but I want to see you actually pay a livable wage. For me to come back and eat at this restaurant, I want to see you pay a livable wage. And I, I show them the, 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 the website on your phone and say, I'd love to see you get rated well as a livable wage employer on this app. That will make me come back the next time I'm here. It's that kind of communication that we think will, especially now, especially right now in so many thousands of restaurants in Texas, in Louisiana, are starting to pay more in order to recruit staff. This is the moment to either go to those restaurants and say, I hope you keep doing this, or to go to other restaurants and say, what's up? You're behind the times. You got to get with the program. The industry's moving in this direction. Everybody needs to be paid a livable wage. That would make me come back here. So it's those two things. It's not just to choose one place over another. It's to communicate with legislators, and it's to communicate with consumers. Sometimes when I speak, I, I did a podcast yesterday, actually with Roy Choi and um, Wilder Valderrama. Some of you may know he's an actor. Um, so we did a podcast together, and at the end of it, they were saying, oh, you know, listening to you, Sarah, we all should just go tip more. And sometimes that's the takeaway, and I beg you, do not hear that as the takeaway. Yes, go tip well, tip well, tip well. Because until we're talking about really, truly livable wages in this country, people need tips on top of $15 an hour to get to something close to livable. $15 an hour is not livable in the Bay Area, which is why we actually have a ballot measure on the November ballot here in California to go to $18 an hour. But uh, it's not livable, so please do tip well, but do, please don't leave thinking, oh, that's what I'm gonna do from now on. That's the thing I take away from Saru's talk is I'm gonna go tip well, because in most states, when you tip, you're actually, with every tip, discounting the worker's wage. That's how it works. Basically, your tip allows the employer to pay less. So yes, tip well, tip very well, but don't just stop there. Tell the employer, I would like to see you pay a livable wage. I see a confused, why is it that your tip cuts against the wage? It's because the way the law works, if tips don't bring a worker to the full minimum wage, the employer actually is supposed to pay the full minimum wage. Most workers don't know that. So every time you tip, it allows the employer to pay less than the minimum wage. Does that make sense? How about, you know, I've noticed a lot, like even when I, you know, I go to the cafe in here, and most of the restaurants now have these, you know, automated POS systems, and now there's not a server anymore. There's not a service, it's self-serve, but the transaction at the counter automatically before you can, you know, give them your credit card, you have to, it defaults to, you know, 15%, 20%, 25%. Yeah. Um, what's up with that? How does that First, I want to talk this? about automation because this always comes up and people always ask it, so I'm just going to answer it. No, we're not, we're not moving to a fully automated restaurant industry. And no, automation actually hasn't killed jobs in this industry. So the Restaurant Association often says, well, if you make me raise my wage, we'll just move to automation. Hasn't happened. It hasn't happened here in California or anywhere where wages are higher. You know, they've tried the little tablets at IHOPs and Denny's and Olive Gardens, and customers have resoundingly rejected. They hate those tablets. They've tried fully automated restaurants in San Francisco and Boston. They've not really worked. And in fact, when they've tried these automated restaurants, the numbers show they've actually had to hire more people to run those. So it, automation has not replaced workers. Fundamentally, we in America, we eat out more than anybody else on earth. You know, in 2017, we achieved world history, becoming the na na first nation in world history in which we spend more money on food eaten outside of the home than we do on food eaten uh, inside of the home. So we eat out more than anybody else on earth. But our desire to eat out doesn't come from wanting to go get food out of a vending machine or from a a tablet. We want to be served. That is fundamentally why we go to eat out in this country. We want to be served something we can't make for ourselves at home uh, by somebody. And so we don't see automation replacing people. But what you're bringing up is problematic because in many states what we've seen is Apple Pay and this automated tip function has basically turned industries outside of the restaurant industry into industries attempting to emulate the restaurant industry by introducing tipping and therefore driving the wage down to a sub-minimum wage. So for example, in Washington, D.C., we saw a number of coffee shops move to this model where they had a screen and it asked you, do you want 5, 10, 
and then attempt to drive their workers' wages from 15 down to 505 because now they were getting tips off this screen. And so, and we saw this, an airline attempted to do this. Airline attempted to have a tablet with the, the tipping percentages and pay the stewardesses the sub-minimum wage because they were getting, uh, you know. So we, th this is really, pro we're seeing other industries, even gig industries, you know, DoorDash and Instacart have attempted to uh, emulate the restaurant industry, cutting against delivery workers' payments by how much they get tipped. And so until we get rid of this scourge, this legacy of original sin in the restaurant industry, you're going to see more and more other industries try to emulate it because of Apple Pay. So. Hi, it's Rue, uh, yeah. Josh, and um, just a quick clarifying question about that. Um, isn't soliciting tips considered to be like illegal and would that be considered like a form of like solicitation of tips, that like automatic screen that, you know, has those percentage options for you? Is it illegal? No, unfortunately. Um, what do you mean? Like, I mean, it's oh, I, I just, I just thought that, like, basically, so, like, if you're a worker or like, I don't know. I mean, it might not apply in this case because it's automated. Um, but like, solicitation of tips is like, I think, supposed to be like, not like, you're not supposed to solicit tips from customers or. Um, um, no, uh, it's not illegal um, because the restaurant industry has fought so hard to entrench tipping in our country and legalize it because they want to get away with paying a sub-minimum wage. So it's not illegal to solicit tips. Maybe what you're thinking of is that it's taboo for a restaurant worker, for example, or any worker to say, hey, why didn't you tip me enough? And this has mm. been a real sore subject for a lot of workers for a long time because so many of them earn the sub-minimum wage, they live off of the tips. If a customer doesn't pay the bill, then yes, that's illegal. You can go after them and say, you gotta pay the bill or I'll call the police. But if a customer doesn't tip, which is how the worker earns their wages, there's often nothing the worker can do. And if they say, why didn't you tip me, they often face retaliation or even firing. So it's not illegal, but there is kind of a taboo rule in our industry that you're not supposed to go ask for it. But it's not at all mm. illegal. Um, just, to oh, yeah. sorry. Okay. Uh, just a follow up question. Um, this was not in the restaurant industry. Um, it was just at a different company where, like, technically the quote-unquote base pay was, like, under the minimum wage of the area, but, like, with what we called incentive pay, or, like, um, which was grossed together from total sales, um, then, you know, that would add us up to, like, above minimum wage. Is that, that would still be considered technically illegal? or not? Like, That's that, illegal. Okay. Because outside of the restaurant industry, that if there's not tipping, if it's like a commission system, you're supposed to be getting mm -hmm. a full minimum wage. Yeah. yeah. Th this year, the theme of the class is reimagining eating in and eating out. Mm. And so one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was the, well, I've been reading about the rise in what's called ghost kitchens. So these sort of anonymous culinary centers where food is being made and in some cases people are like creating a brand that doesn't really exist except yep. on an app. W what's happening to the workforce in that ecosystem? Yeah, I think my biggest concern about that is, is workers in this industry were already invisible. In a ghost kitchen, they are literally invisible. They are, I mean, they're ghosts. They're literally invisible. And so, you know, your inability to know how people are treated or what's happening behind the kitchen door, actually that was the name of my first book, behind the kitchen door, it, it's just that much harder. So I will say, I think there's been a lot of innovation during the pandemic, rethinking of the industry. People had, were forced to think about doing things differently and especially because of the staffing crisis, people have been forced to pay more. So I think there's been a lot of innovation, which is great. That's an innovation I'm not, thrilled about because, uh, because it does create more and more of a barrier between you and the humans that are producing your food. Hi, Hi. sorry. Uh, my name is Hatiwa. I'm an intended business major, um, but I also am very interested in terms of like your line of work. Um, first, thank you so much for even touching on the topics of like women and of course, like POC women in the industry. I personally, like my sister's a server, and she tells me like of the horrendous stories that she faces, especially amidst the pandemic, um, 
just even, I feel sometimes we live in a California bubble. I'm from Los Angeles. And like my sister, although she gets paid minimum wage, it's still so prevalent, the sexual harassment that she faces mm -hmm. in her industry. Um, and I feel like that's not talked about enough. So thank you so much for even touching yeah. on that. Um, secondly, I was just curious, like, as someone like me, I'm just turned 19 years old, I still am trying to work in your line of work in terms of like mixing, still having funding and things like that, like a non-for-profit, but still, you know, emulating change in, in, in this industry in terms of low-income families and, and changing that system. What would you tell your 19-year-old self in terms of like <laughs> how to educate yourself? Because I didn't even know about again, California bubble, that somewhere in this country that we say is a first world country and, and so liberal and, and, and et cetera, there's people that are getting paid $2 an hour. And that is unacceptable completely, as you said. So what would you tell your 19-year-old self to be more educated on the topic as well as other than going and telling restaurant workers, hey, are you on this? Like, what would you do when you were younger to educate yourself more? What books would you read and, and things like that? Yeah, it's a great question. When I was 19, I definitely did not know the word organizing. You know, I too wanted to create change and I, I, you know, started, I was doing community service while in college. I was delivering food to homeless people. I was doing tutoring and mentoring because those were the things I knew to try to contribute. Um, and it wasn't till I, you know, was in graduate school, law school, I learned late. <laughs> and then was exposed to Marshall Gans at, at Harvard. At the, I went to the Kennedy School, got my master's in public policy at Harvard. That's when I really began to understand the theory of organizing. So me personally, what I would tell my 19-year-old self is to learn about organizing as a means of change. Because when I learned about it and I did it, it just made so much more sense than anything else I had doing. And this is not to denigrate service, it's not to denigrate traditional advocacy or activism. For me, there is nothing more transformative than the people most affected leading their own struggle for change. Why? Because when you, as a service provider or a lawyer or an advocate, when you're working on behalf of people, you may change their conditions temporarily for the moment, some, you know, you make sure they're not hungry. That's what Jose does. He makes sure people are not hungry. Or you may advocate on behalf of somebody else and they get something they didn't have before. But in terms of long-lasting, permanent, structural, transformational change, it will fundamentally take not just changing people's conditions, but their power and their access to continuously changing their conditions, not just once, but for their lifetimes. And so to me, Organizing, to me, is the most powerful, long-lasting, truly structural way to change things. And so I would have told my 19-year-old self to learn about it, to go get exposed to it, to go intern in a group or an organization or a union, somebody that's doing organizing, to understand how it works. Because the earlier I, would, I was exposed, I would have been exposed to it, I think the better off I would have been figuring out how to build a career out of it. Yeah, and I'm so sorry, just a quick follow-up. Yeah. So when I was younger, I worked in terms of like, and I've said this before, but like WIC and EBT, those types of systems. And one thing that I noticed a lot when I would go to the low-income areas that I grew up in and trying to provide food and, and aid and really knowledge on how one can even get on that, especially for undocumented people, one thing that I noticed a lot was the fear that undocumented people have in terms of, wanting to go organize that and knowing that it's possible, but knowing the fact that that could get them deported as, as such a big thing. And I know you said that you worked with a lot of undocumented people. What would you recommend in terms of like, not incentivizing because obviously their livelihood is the incentive of changing that, but in terms of making sure that and assuring that they're safe in those conditions. So this is what I teach in my class, which I should be teaching again this fall. So if people are around in Berkeley in the fall, you can take my class. Um, but believe it or not, it's not just undocumented people who have fear. We all have fear. Every American, every person in this world has fear. And it's a different kind of fear. I'm, fear of, I'm afraid of losing my job. I don't want to speak up because I'm afraid of losing my job. I'm afraid of uh, looking strange or weird if I speak out or protest. I, I'm afraid of being embarrassed if I speak out or protest. I'm afraid of being deported. 
I'm afraid of retaliation by my boss or my community. There's so many different reasons why both documented and undocumented people, people with all the privilege and people with no privilege, all have some kind of fear. And what we do as organizers is we give people hope. We agitate people to understand that there is no other future uh, for change. Like, if we are, allow ourselves to be afraid, our children are going to be in the same situation that we're in. There's only one way to change things for our children, and it's to overcome our fear. And yes, take risks sometimes that are scary, but that are necessary to create change. And believe me, in the organizing we've done, undocumented workers are often at the front. They're the ones leading everybody else and showing that I have everything to lose, but I'm going to fight. And it inspires often documented people who, to get over their fear. So everybody has a, 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 some barrier in their mind that prevents them from pushing, from ch you know, advocating. And listen, everybody here has a situation in which you could organize. If you live in a tenant building, you could organize as tenants against your landlord. If you work in a restaurant, you could organize with coworkers for higher wages. I mean, I hate to say this, Will, but you could organize as students to say, <laughs> we want to hear a certain speaker or professor. You have power as students that you don't know you have to engage collectively and demand things, but everybody has a, a fear to, that prevents them from doing that, and this is what we teach in our class, how to give people hope, how to agitate, how to give people a sense of what could be different if we act collectively. How do we help you organize the certificate program in organizing? <laughs> what, what can the students do to help you? Oh, I would love it if any of you are interested in being a part of this. This summer, actually, we're running a, uh, we're calling it Freedom Summer. We did, we've done it a couple of years in a row here at Berkeley through the African American Studies Department. And we provide a, a course in organizing and an opportunity to be a part of uh, actually organizing workers in different parts of the country. You can do it remotely or you can do it live and we can help with housing. Um, but it's a really wonderful summer opportunity. This summer, uh, well this year, we're putting One Fair Wage on the ballot in November in Michigan, which is a really big deal because uh, Michigan, the election this year in Michigan is very critical. The governor is up for re-election. And some of you may remember in November 2020 what happened to the governor of Michigan uh, when Biden was chosen as the person, you know, that was chosen by the state of Michigan, uh, if you may remember, armed people stormed the Capitol with guns, uh, tried to kidnap the governor. And so if the governor loses her position in the fall, she's a Democrat, if she loses her position in November 2022, um, it's pretty likely that Michigan will go for Trump or his cronies in 24. And so it's a critical election, but she's not doing that well. People are not that excited to vote. Because, um, you know, things are still really bad in Michigan. There's, there's a wage of $3.67. People are not that excited or engaged. And so we're putting this directly on the ballot so people can go vote themselves a raise. And when they do, they will vote. <laughs> they will go vote. And so we'll be engaging students this summer to be talking to low-wage workers in Michigan, either remotely, you could do it from here in California, or you could go to Michigan and we'll provide housing, but um, to go talk to workers in Michigan about you know, why voting is important and the fact that they can go vote themselves a raise and talk to other workers about voting themselves a raise, and we'll train you in organizing and how to do that. So if people are interested in that, um, please get my email from Will. But that's the beginning. We're, we're, what we're trying to do is grow that summer program into a summer certificate, and then from there, create more and more classes during the school year where you can take organizing, social movements, uh, all leadership development of low wage, of low income people, all of these things. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you, and thank you so much for all your work oh, and talking you. to us today. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. One more question tonight. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Hi, Saru. My name is Shechi. Um, I'm a freshman here at Berkeley. I just wanted to thank you for coming out tonight. And um, when you presented like the information about how, you know, the the concept of tips being like an add-on to minimum wage or just being the wage, like it came post-emancipation, and you touched upon how the New Deal it was supposed to increase wages, but they literally excluded black people and tipped workers, and I don't know, I never really learned about this exclusion like in history class and things like that. And I was just curious, like, how come we don't learn about 
these things. Like how I never even knew what the National Restaurant Association was like bef until this lecture. And I don't know, how can I like learn more about these topics? <laughs> well, I thank you for asking. Um, most people don't know this. I mean, it, it, it is sad that you don't learn this as part of your history because the New Deal was incredible in so many ways and exclusionary in so many ways that people don't know about. Um, I mean, we have a long history of just exclusion in, at every turn <laughs> in this country. And so, you know, I've written a couple books on this. That would be a, a place to start to learn about this history. Um, I wrote, a, a Behind the Kitchen Door was one book I wrote, Forked, A New Standard for American Dining. And then my most recent book is One Fair Wage, Ending Subminimum Pay in America. So those would be places to learn. Um, and if you have classes where people are teaching the New Deal uh, or any of that history, um, please bring it up because it is definitely a part of history that's not discussed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Did the video get queued up, Pooja? No. Or? Um, what no. I can do is email it to you. Maybe yeah, you can show it. Yeah, um, send me the link, and I can distribute the link, awesome. too. Awesome. That would be great. Because I'm going to share that link with Jose. Oh, oh, I did get it. Oh. Um, <laughs> Do you want to show it real quick? We'll show I don't know this. If you can um, take it from my test. Where are our class representatives? Are you here? Come on down, because I'm going to give you the microphone in a, in a minute, and you get to run the rest of the class. Yes. How's that? <laughs> Why don't you introduce yourself while Pooja's getting that? Wait, we should do attendance first. Okay. Well, are we going to show well, the video? Well, you introduce yourselves. Yeah. And then I'll play the video, and then we can leave. OK, great. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Kate. I'm a sophomore studying business and data science. Hi, everyone. My name is Kenneth, a uh, junior studying business and in industrial engineering. Um, let me do one of the give the instructions for the, the midterm eval, and then we'll, we'll, we'll play the, the clip. In a yeah, there's, there's going to be a form. Um, is it on the slides? Actually? No, because I can just try to yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's a form. Yeah. Uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty short. There's going to be six questions, and then just uh, after you fill out the attendance link, just fill out the form uh, with your feedback, and we'll probably take the next uh, 10 minutes to do the form. Uh, yeah, we'll take... Well, I'll play the clip, and then we'll have until 8. So Here's what we're going to do. So we're doing attendance. We're going to show the clip. Yep. We're going to let Saru finish. We're going to give her a standing ovation. <laughs> and then you get to do the class evaluation. How's that sound? OK, good. Let's see the clip. Can we get the sound? <laughs> yeah, I mean, to, so if Oma, um is one of our leaders. She often is saying around the country, Congress, everywhere, what she said here, which is that we, we now know our self-worth. We know what we're worth. We're not worth $2 or $5 in DC. We're worth at least $15 an hour plus tips. Uh, and it, it just reminds me of um, a couple of years ago, I may have shared this in an earlier class, but there was a New York Times piece a couple of years ago on uh, the Copenhagen airports, um, you know, there the wage is $21 an hour for restaurant workers. It, and there are some tips. If there are, there are tips, they are on top of $21 an hour. But the, the New York Times reporter asked the man who runs all the restaurants in the Copenhagen airport, why do you pay this? And he said, well, if we didn't pay this, then people might need to live on public assistance, and that would be the sign of a failed society. And in this country... Uh, restaurant workers use $16 billion annually of public assistance, not because they want to, not because they're lazy. These are people working two and three jobs and living on public assistance. And that is the sign of a failed society when people are working more than full time and still having to rely on government assistance. That is the sign of a failed society. And it is why I said we have two choices. We can move forward into this really beautiful, historic, momentous moment change is on the horizon, or we can regress and stay stagnant and say, no, we're not going to change. 
and fail. That is truly the only two choices that we have. So I really appreciate you all listening and, and hope to stay in touch. And we would really appreciate your midterm feedback. It's really valuable to us. Yeah. Uh, I'll be leaving with the teaching team. And please uh, fill out the form that you can find at these links. Yeah, I was going to say one, one quick thing before heading out. Uh, so for next week, we do have a couple assignments. So for the favorite meal, the lifetime impact and alternatives. Um, this is asking you to think about the broader impact of your meal over your lifetime. And then we have two discussion board questions again. Like we said, if you could fill out the mid-semester evaluation, it is really valuable for us. Thanks.